I may have to stand up here. I've been getting some complaints that nobody can see me, you know, so, because I'm so short, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, we'll, in the coming weeks, uh, there may be some changes. Uh, there, in the pews are little prayer cards, and so we'll, we'll, we'll try to get a little complaint box, prayer box going, you know what I'm saying, so... So you don't have to like bludgeon us personally. You could just anonymously, lovingly drop a card in there, you know. <laughs> so business uh, is aside and, uh, and now really just a time to meet with the Lord, if you will, and, and see what he has for us. So let's pray. Again, Renee, thank you for being here and um, such a blessing, uh, just being faithful and, and all that. And so we're just thankful for you. Okay. All right. Father God, we want to come to you and, and we, we thank you for, for Renee. We thank you for Steve and the influence that they've had in our lives. We thank you, God, that, that they did, in fact, put their hand to the plow and, and not looking back, just pursued the things that you had for them. We thank you that this place is really... Um, I don't know where it would be without them, it really, in, in a way. And yet, God, I know that you provide. And so we, we thank you for them. Father, we pray even now that, that you, would, um, you would do a fresh work, Lord, not just in this church, not just in this community. We pray that all the time, and we mean it. But God, it, it has to start with us in our hearts and our living. And so I pray that your word would, would just so come alive to us this morning and that you would speak to us the things that, that we sincerely need to hear, and that we would take it home and to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I know you're going to be tempted to be reading that list. I hear the pages already. You, you might want to set it down. Um, it's going to be a distraction. I'm only saying that because I know I would be trying to flip through the list quietly, you know? <laughs> But the list isn't going anywhere, all right? It's in your hands. You've got it. You're set. <laughs> Let's see what God has. That's, that's the main objective today. We're still going through Mark. We're in Mark chapter 6. Um, we talked about love last week, right, with Derek sharing. And, uh, and, and, it, and there's that verse, faith, hope, and love. But of all, above all is love, right? And so if we don't have love for one another, then that's, that's problematic. And so we're going to jump right into Mark, uh, Mark chapter 6, um, where we left off uh, a few weeks back. Verse 1. And he went out from there, and he came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many listeners were astonished, saying, Where? Did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? Such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. If you have a cell phone, you got it. Put that thing on silent. <laughs> you know, when, when, uh, when God wants to speak volumes is when you have that many distractions, you know? <laughs> you ever try to get along with God, and then all of a sudden, you're getting messages and voicemails and pages, or who has pagers anymore? <laughs> what am I? <laughs> And you know that the enemy does not want you to spend time with the Lord. And he'll do anything he can uh, to interfere with that. But so we see Jesus. He's coming to his hometown. And, and what is happening? When we minister to our family, our friends, what happens? We're so common with them that kind of it gets discarded, if you will. I know with my own son, Ministering to my son is not an easy task. It's not hard, but breaking through, that's the hard part, you know. 
Matt, how many of you guys have sons here and you've experienced something similar? Yeah, right? Exactly. And, and, and they look at you and they're like, come on, dad. Seriously? I don't need it. Plug their ears or whatever. And so Jesus, he's in his hometown. His disciples follow him. The Sabbath, he's teaching. See, they acknowledge that he speaks great wisdom. They acknowledge he does mighty works. They acknowledge his teaching, par none. I'd rather it was him teaching us this morning, you know. <laughs> I really do. Par, second to none. They acknowledge all those things, undeniable, undeniable, undeniable. But he's too common for them. He's just too average. Now, if he was wearing a purple robe, that might say something. If he had pulled up in a chariot with two Arabian horses, now we're talking. You see what I'm getting at? It's the common that the Lord uses. The common things. There's a scripture, it's in 1 Corinthians, and, uh, and some of you guys have your, your Bibles with you. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to read it to you because it's really just a great section. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, and, and it's, a, it's a good section of verses. But listen to this. For the word of the cross is to those that are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For us it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. Jesus was just too common, way too common. And the people who knew him from when he was a kid and, and young, they, he's just too common, too ordinary. He's too much like us. And I was just kind of pondering this. And it, it is interesting to me because in the everyday ordinary life, we can miss things because it's ordinary. It's common. I was at Juanita's. You know, I hang out around. I love Juanita's. Some people don't, but I do. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'm at Juanita's. I'm waiting for a fish burrito. Just, you know, like everyone else is waiting for their food. And, and there's this... this um, I, I don't know what to call him, but, but kind of a drunk, you know, an old drunk. He's in the neighborhood. I see him all the time. And, and I think about him because I see him all the time. And his life, honestly, is a train wreck. It is completely a train wreck. He's, I don't know how old he is, but he's, and, and I'm not putting anyone down. That's not what I'm doing here. But he's, he's, he's got a walker. And he's got bags hanging off, and, and, and I see him slumped over where I live by the liquor store, just waiting for his next drink. I feel bad. His life, literally, when you look at alcohol and what it can do to a person, I see that guy. The devastation that it can do to a person, I see that guy. That's why he's etched in my mind. That's why I see him all around town. I don't know. And I'm sitting there waiting for my burrito, my fish burrito. And he's walking across the street there. You know, it takes a while. The common, ordinary thing. I don't want us to miss that. In the ordinary life, there are lessons to be learned. This young guy who knew him, I'm just watching. This 30-year-old guy who knew him said, hey, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in forever. And he comes up and he's patting him and he's asking him how he's doing. 
The guy can barely walk. He's just getting by. And the guy's talking to him. He knows him. He hugs him. And the guy, it, guy hugs in public are not cool, just so you know, okay? <laughs> but that doesn't stop him. And he's hugging him. And, and he's like, hey, you know? <laughs> But you know what I saw? When he walked away, you could see a little smirk, a little gladness. Somebody cares. Maybe everyone else ignores me. Maybe I don't know today from tomorrow. But that guy cares. We can miss so many great lessons. If we don't pay attention to the ordinary life, the things that are just happening right in front of us, we can just go on about our business and and do our day and miss entirely something that God is wanting to do. And I'm like, Lord, why? Why would you show me that? Why did it make an impact? Do you know why? I don't know his name. I've seen him for months. I've thought about him, but I don't know his name. Shame on me. But now I'm going to make it a point. I'm going to get to know his name. You know what I'm saying? See, we don't want to miss out because the ordinary life happens. And if, and if we're not looking to see, we will miss it. And here these people were. They saw Jesus. He's just too common. He's too ordinary. Of course he teaches well. Look at the works of his hands. But he's just, he's too much like us. And they missed it. They missed it. It's too ordinary. I don't want us to miss it. Life is going by and I want to be involved. I want us to be involved. And so, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And then Jesus says to them, verse 4, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own home, among his own relatives and his own household. And we already mentioned how hard it is to minister to your own family, you know. (laughs) It's not easy. In verse 5, he could do no miracle there, except that he laid laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. No mighty work of power. And he wondered, and this phrase, he wondered, uh, in the King James, it says, he marveled. Do you know how many times Jesus marvels? It's recorded. How many times? I I think it's two, okay? Exactly, which we're going to cover, the centurion, okay? There are only two recorded times that Jesus marvels. And they're both in relation to other people's faith. That tells me something. That tells me that that's important. The fact that Jesus would only marvel twice, stand amazed. That has to be important. And so we look at it. um, He marvels at at their unbelief. He wondered at their unbelief, and then he was just going about the villages. But I was thinking about those two instances where he marvels, okay? This is one. Now, these are his, his home countrymen, fellow Jewish people, and they lack belief, and he marvels. 
But when we look at the other instance, we, um, we see it in, uh, okay, Matthew 8, 5. And when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, entreating him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering great pain, in great pain. And he said to him, Jesus says, I will come and heal him. That's great. It's fantastic. But the centurion answered, verse 8, and he said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to the other, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled. The same exact phrase, marveled. And he said, truly, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. So he's marveling at those who believe and those who don't believe. Which one do I want to be? That's a good question, isn't it? Who do I want to be? What category? And he says, I say to you that many shall come, verse 11, from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham alive, Isaac alive, Jacob alive in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out in outer darkness. He's talking about the Jewish people there who don't believe. Crazy. And then he said to the centurion, verse 13, go your way. Let it be done as you have believed. And it says his servant was healed that very hour. Isn't that cool? Just to see the contrast but both times related to other people's faith. And I, I was thinking, well, how do I build my faith? And how does that work exactly? Because it, it happens over time, you know? You don't just pray for faith and get it. Well, I don't. I haven't seen that. <laughs> I haven't experienced that. Maybe you have. I haven't. <laughs> but... Uh, there's, there's kind of an example here in Mark, and uh, I don't want to cover it uh, too much but because we're going to actually get there down the road as we're going through Mark. But it's in Mark 9, verse 23. And, and we see there's this guy, and he brings his son to Jesus, and he wants his son healed. He's having convulsions and all this other stuff, grinding of the teeth. And he says in verse 21, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, it has often thrown him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, and this is the key point, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. I kind of like those three words that Jesus starts with, if you can. Jesus is being honest with him. If you can believe, it'll happen. And look at the response. The boy's father cried and began saying, I do believe, but help my unbelief. That's being honest with God. God doesn't want fake. You know what's funny? We, we tend to want to put a good face on, you know, with each other and, and, and this and that. But you can do it with God, but you're not fooling anyone, you know. <laughs> I mean, God's like scratching his head. When you put your face oh. Oh, Holy Father, you know, and there's all this, wait a second here. 
<laughs> get real, Mike. Come on, you know. I know who you are. And this guy is coming and he's saying, Lord, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. He's being honest with God. God likes that. God completely digs you for who you are. I've heard the simplest prayers by just babes in Christ. And they were true, real. And then I've heard others pray, and, and they just, it's like molasses, you know? <laughs> it's just like molasses, just, oh, it covers everything. And you're like, wait a second, what is happening here? But just being real with God. God, I don't know what's going on in this situation. But I'm going to trust you in it. God, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm going to hang in there. I don't know how it's going to work. Heck, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, that's the truth. We don't. Think about that. Life could literally change dramatically by tomorrow for all of us. One earthquake. I mean, I, I, not, to, not to freak you guys out, but life could literally change. There are people that cross the street and, hey, the jig is up. It's it. So the point is, I think, just us being real with God where we are. And, and not losing sight of God wanting to just use common people in common situations in everyday life. See, I think that's what God wants to do. So um, we're going to close in prayer. Hey, Father, we thank you for your love. I thank you for the interaction. And, and Lord, with, with everything going on, we know that we can trust you. And so we just want to commit um, just these words to our heart and to our living. Um, we pray, Father, for this, this fellowship and for this community. And God, that you would help us not to miss just the average things um, in life and, 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 then, and miss out on the exceptional ways that you want to use us. And so, again, by your spirit, that you would just quicken us to know when that is, uh, what to say, uh, Lord, we may not even know at the moment, um, but that, God, you would intervene and, and just kind of give us a loving nudge in Jesus' name.